Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present uh, one of my recent uh, works. I am Francesco Gringoli. I am full professor of uh, computer networks at the University of Brescia in Italy. And uh, uh, well, uh, my main research field is uh, wireless networking. And in wireless networking, uh, in particular, I am interested in uh, understanding uh, possible vulnerabilities of devices, including uh, Wi-Fi, LTE, 5G, and then performance analysis uh, and designing new medium access control algorithm. So today I am presenting a, a work that uh, was uh, a, originally a collaboration between me and uh, Giska Klassen. She is uh, a researcher in uh, uh, Technische Universität Darmstadt in Germany, and uh, she is an expert in uh, security in general. And uh, more specifically, Giska has a lot of experience with uh, Bluetooth and the remote code execution in Bluetooth. So you see that uh, we call this work Spectra. I will explain later why we chosen this uh, name for similarity with Spectre and uh, uh, the problem, the very well-known problem uh, in, uh, that affects uh, all Intel, but also ARM CPUs. Here, there is a similar vulnerability uh, in the field of uh, wireless chipset. Uh, so let's start with the motivation for this work. So Giska, as I already said, has a lot of experience with the Bluetooth, with the analysis of Bluetooth chips. So she discovered uh, a lot of uh, CVE. So uh, in particular, she understood that uh, the majority of the chips that uh, are uh, uh, exploitable remotely, even when you think uh, you are in safe mode. So you might switch into airplane mode and you think that your device uh, is a uh, wireless uh, death. This is not true. Still, uh, it is possible to uh, to penetrate into your device by using the Bluetooth chipset. So uh, anyways, a Bluetooth, uh, as Giska told me, yeah, it's nice, but uh, uh, has some limitation, even if uh, it was recognized by other uh, exper very experienced people like Matthew Green, that is one of the main uh, researcher in the field of uh, security of cryptocurrency and uh, in the field of security in general. So she was very proud that uh, uh, Matthew Green, after publishing all this TV, contacted her on, uh, on Twitter and mentioned her work. But as Jiska told me, uh, Bluetooth uh, has some limitations in terms of uh, security and in terms of uh, explain security to people because uh, you say, okay, it is possible to penetrate your device uh, using Bluetooth. Yeah, but uh, Bluetooth unfortunately is connected using very slow interfaces because Bluetooth uh, is connected using a serial interface. So it is a uh, very difficult uh, after you uh, exploit the vulnerability in Bluetooth that you are able to pop up a window in a smartphone. So it's almost impossible because uh, the CPU that uh, is hosting the Bluetooth uh, software has not a very deep connectivity with the rest of the system. Wi-Fi instead is completely different because uh, Wi-Fi is a very high throughput device. So in this case, uh, with Wi-Fi, uh, given its connection, with uh, the typically PCI Express, it is possible actually to penetrate into Wi-Fi and then uh, by running some uh, um, uh, escalation through the PCI Express bus, you can also try popping up uh, an application on the device, on the, on the screen of the smartphone. So with Bluetooth, it's not possible. So with Wi-Fi, potentially it is possible. So for this reason, Giska contacted me because uh, uh, I had a very long experience in doing reverse engineering of Wi-Fi chips. So she uh, asked me, can we do something together? Is it possible that from Bluetooth we can escalate into Wi-Fi? And the answer we will see is yes. So from Bluetooth, it is possible after you penetrate into the Bluetooth, it is possible to uh, escalate into the Wi-Fi. And from there, it is possible then to escalate into the main uh, CPU of the host. Then um, 
I will explain how we discovered this vulnerability in uh, details in the next slide, but then um, there is a immediately, it comes uh, immediately another question. So if it is possible to go from Bluetooth into Wi-Fi, is it also possible then to exploit a similar vulnerability and penetrate into LTE chipset that uh, has uh, also access to the network with some uh, privileged role? Um, and we discovered, yes, it is also possible to uh, try uh, escalating into the LTE chipset. So let's see why it is possible to uh, escalate from Bluetooth into Wi-Fi and also into LTE. Well, uh, basically what we are trying to do is to break the separation that uh, between different chips. So it's a sort of inter-chip separation with that we can break it. But why it is possible to break this separation? And the reason for uh, this possibility is that uh, uh, these chips at Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and even LTE are sharing frequencies in the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum or very close to that. And you know why? Because uh, this 2.4 uh, band was uh, initially, was the first one to be initially released for uh, uh, running uh, whatever you want to run into this band, including the Bluetooth and also the wireless, the Wi-Fi. So this means that to optimize performance, uh, you have to arbitrate how these chips at Bluetooth and Wi-Fi are accessing the channel, because otherwise, if you do not control uh, this uh, access uh, in the two chipsets that are on the same device, one chipset can interfere with the other one. So there is uh, the possibility that they are colliding. And this is no good uh, because uh, you are, uh, uh, of course, you are, you are lowering the maximum throughput that is possible if you are uh, having a, a collision from within the same uh, device. So um, to have uh, this uh, possibility that the two chips at uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth in this case are arbitrating their transmission, you need to have uh, a communication interface between these two chips. And if you have a direct communication interface between the two chips at uh, then it means that uh, we are bypassing the host. So in a smartphone, we have uh, the main CPU that is running uh, Android or iOS, and then we have uh, these uh, separate chips at one for Bluetooth and the other one for Wi-Fi. But we have a direct communication between the two chipsets uh, to arbitrate their channel access. This means that the host cannot even realize that uh, there is this uh, uh, somebody that is trying to escalate from the Bluetooth into the Wi-Fi because this escalation is occurring in an interface that the host is not even checking. So um, let's see, let's see the general, the very general uh, wireless architecture. You know, this is for iOS, but a very similar uh, uh, architecture is shared uh, also in Android devices. So here we have uh, the application space that is uh, where we have the main Android, well, not Android in this case, iOS kernel with all the applications. Then we have uh, the Bluetooth chipset. And then we have also the Wi-Fi chipset. Each one is controlled on the host by a specific driver. Then for the Bluetooth, the driver is communicating usually over a serial interface with the underlying chipset, the Bluetooth, that is uh, then powered by a separate ARM CPU. For the Wi-Fi is uh, very similar. We have uh, a Wi-Fi driver that is communicating with the Wi-Fi chipset using uh, another interface, usually a PCI Express. On the Wi-Fi chipset, we have yet another ARM CPU plus uh, other microcontroller that are necessary for, uh, for accessing the channel. Wi-Fi is a high-speed high speed protocol, so it uh, uh, requires uh, a, a a lot of performances for accessing the channel in the right manner. For this reason, in the typical Wi-Fi chips that we have an ARM CPU for controlling the uh, upper space of the chips, uh, that means uh, um, slow operations. And then we have a, a dedicated microcontroller for instead controlling uh, uh, those operations that are time critical, like accessing the channel, accessing the channel in the right 
way in the right time. But then we have this uh, interface that is uh, the serial enhanced coexistence interface. For brevity, I will call it sexy. And uh, the two chips, uh, the Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi, are communicating directly to arbitrate how they access the channel in the 2.4 gigahertz band. Then we have also another interface uh, for uh, doing the same type of arbitration between the Bluetooth, uh, Wi-Fi, and the LTE chipset. So uh, the reason here is that uh, even though LTE is not using directly the 2.4 gigahertz band, we know that there is one LTE band that is very, very close to 2.4. That is for the uplink, the 2.5 gigahertz, and for the downlink, the 2.6 gigahertz band. So we need to have also an interface for arbitrating the transmission of LTE and uh, the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth. So uh, in the, um, the case of LTE, this interface is usually called MWS, that stands for Mobile Wireless Standard. What is the impact of uh, um, breaking the separation between these three chipsets. Well, I will show during this presentation that uh, we have three impact. First of all, the easiest to demonstrate is denial of service. So one wireless call deny the transmission to the other core. And here, uh, basically what I will show you is that it is possible from the Wi-Fi to inhibit completely the Bluetooth transmission. Then there is also another possibility that is a, a finer grain. That is the possibility that for, within the Wi-Fi chipset, uh, we can understand what is doing the Bluetooth chipset. So imagine what happens if the Bluetooth is used for typing over a remotely connected uh, HID keyboard. So in this case, if we are able to monitor uh, the Wi-Fi chipset from inside because we remote exploited the Wi-Fi chipset, then we have access also to the timing between key presses. And we know that by observing the timing between key presses, it is possible to infer what the user is doing, like typing a password, trying to guess the password. So we have a lot of possibilities in this way. And then uh, this is the most interesting uh, uh, impact uh, is the code execution. So if we are able to do some uh, remote code execution on Bluetooth, which we are, because as Giska demonstrated, that there are many possibilities uh, for uh, modern devices that, are, by the way, cannot even patch it anymore. So if we were able to enter the, the Bluetooth chipset remotely over the air, and this is possible then with e Spectra, I will show you that we can then uh, remote uh, exploit also the Wi-Fi going through the Bluetooth. So we first enter a, a device, a smartphone, by uh, using one of these uh, remote uh, code execution vulnerability. And after enter the, entering the Bluetooth chipset, we are able to escalate into the Wi-Fi. I underline again, without the possibility for the main host to discover that this attack is going on because the two chipset are uh, talking directly without uh, any direct connection to the host. Okay, so uh, now um, the reason for the name uh, is the following. So you remember that uh, with Spectre, they demonstrated that it is possible in a virtualized environment uh, uh, exploiting uh, the vulnerability of the Intel, uh, but also AMD and now also ARM CPU. It is possible from one virtualized operating system to understand what is doing another operating system by exploiting uh, this, uh, um, this uh, um, feature of this CPU to predict uh, what uh, the next instruction will do. It is possible to understand the content of the memory of a completely separate virtual machine. So we have two virtual machines and it is possible from one to control the other. Here, we decided to call our attack Spectra because, uh, well, it is a typically for nerd to understand this, but I, I, I need to explain. Because first of all, because of the similarity with Spectra, and then because uh, wireless means also that it, there is the spectrum and then spectra used by two devices that can escalate one into the other. So this was the origin of uh, our uh, spectra name. Okay, so now let's move on 
and uh, uh, let's uh, study how this uh, coexistence uh, interface works on uh, a specific chipset that is uh, manufactured by Broadcom. And the reason uh, to consider initially the Broadcom chipset is because I am uh, I have a lot of experience with the reverse engineering Wi-Fi developed by Broadcom and Giska has a lot of experience in uh, uh, reverse engineering and discovering vulnerability for uh, Broadcom Bluetooth. So given that usually they are integrated embedded into single devices, then this was the, the, uh, our preferred choice. Let's start with Broadcom because we know how they work. So first of all, uh, Broadcom, was it a, a good choice? And the answer is yes, because uh, they are empowering more than 1 billion of devices today. In fact, they are the most used adopted chips that uh, you can find the Broadcom devices on all iPhone, on a lot of MacBooks, iMacs, older Apple watches. Then uh, there are a lot of uh, Samsung devices that are using Broadcom devices uh, for the Wi-Fi connectivity and the same for Google. Then interestingly, uh, Raspberry Pi, they, have, uh, they are completely based on Broadcom because the main CPU, the Wi-Fi and the chipset, uh, the Bluetooth chipset, they are entirely Broadcom devices. And then there are a lot of IoT devices that are also using Broadcom chipset. So uh, then there is also another reason, very important for people running uh, reverse engineering, and it is the following, that the firmware, can be simply uploaded to the CPU. Then I can decide uh, I want to change the firmware of the Wi-Fi. Then I upload a different firmware, one that I patched with the binary patching, the same for the Bluetooth. So there is no firmware checks. We are used now to consider almost impossible to do the same with LT because if you want to change the firmware of LT, then you need to have access to the private key of the manufacturer so that you can generate a, a digital signature that is controlled by the CPU of the LT when you are trying to upgrade its software. For Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, no. There are, there are no firmware checks. You can simply upload into these two chips at whatever firmware you want. So you take one original firmware, you reverse engineering, this firmware and then you modify it so that it starts executing your code. This is very nice to understand the internal of uh, a chipset without having access to the documentation. This is the typical job of people doing reverse engineering for discovering vulnerabilities, for reusing devices, for experimenting with uh, future uh, channel access algorithms. So there are a lot of reasons behind this uh, practice. So this is uh, uh, the coexistence interface uh, that was reported by a data sheet that was publicly uh, available on Google, on Google, well, uh, searchable at least uh, using Google. So this was the chipset embedded in a quite old smartphone that was the Google Nexus 5. So this is uh, a Broadcom 4339 chipset that is embedding uh, both a Bluetooth device and a Wi-Fi interface. By studying uh, the, um, the, the data sheet, you can see these uh, uh, two lines uh, in red, more than two. So here you see there is this uh, uh, general coexistence interface that uh, is a slow uh, interface that is used for arbitrating the communication and the channel access of the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth. So we completely analyzed how this interface works, and then we start playing on modifying the firmware image to see what happens if the Wi-Fi does not respect the rules for accessing this interface. But then there is a, another interesting uh, um, underline the red part on this data sheet, and this is this one on the top. You can read here WLAN RAM sharing. So this means that at least on this chipset, the two uh, devices, the Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi, are also sharing a part of the RAM. So, okay, here you see one is an int. One thing is uh, this serial interface, uh, this general coexistence access interface. That is a slow interface where basically the, the Wi-Fi can simply tell the Bluetooth to stop working and the Bluetooth can do the same. This is a simple channel arbitration mechanism. And the damages that you can do 
if you uh, try to modify the behavior of this interface cannot be that much because it's just a serial interface with a lot of a sort of semaphore telling to each other of the two chips that uh, stop because they want to access the channel. But RAM sharing is a complete different uh, thing. I mean, if the Bluetooth can access the Wi-Fi RAM, well, then maybe from the Bluetooth, if we are able to remote exploit the Bluetooth, we can then, by using this RAM sharing interface, we can inject code directly in the Wi-Fi interface. And I underline, again, without the main host, the one running Android in the case of Google Nessus 5, understanding that this attack is undergoing. There is uh, also this uh, other part of uh, the data sheet uh, where basically uh, they are uh, explaining that uh, at least the slow uh, general coexistence interface is actually used for arbitrating uh, the channel access between Wi-Fi, um, wi WLAN, and the Bluetooth. And this is uh, implemented in the Nexus 5 uh, for uh, uh, performance reason. And so I will show you in a while uh, now that if we can break this interface, uh, the Bluetooth uh, simply dies. So uh, let's start uh, understanding this serial enhanced coexistence interface, this sexy interface with uh, other possible name, ACI, GCI, as I already showed. So interestingly, um, Broadcom at some point was, uh, uh, at least the IoT division was uh, bought by uh, Cypress. And Cypress is a manufacturer that uh, uh, is trying to sell uh, solutions to uh, IoT um, implementers. So for this reason, uh, Cypress uh, started embedding Bluetooth uh, and Wi-Fi chips that originally developed by Broadcom into development board that you can buy. They are quite cheap. For less than 80 euro, you can buy the Wi-Fi development board. For the same price, you can buy the Bluetooth development board. So uh, um, why uh, I'm now talking about development board? Because uh, they are easier to work with. So when you are trying to understand uh, the internals, uh, because uh, actually there is no documentation apart from the data sheet, then it's much easier to play with the development board than uh, opening uh, Nexus 5, uh, desoldering uh, uh, the chipset, uh, then uh, putting wires between the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth. Because if you try to do this on uh, a Nexus 5, basically you, you completely destroy the device. With the development board, this is completely different because actually in the documentation, they explain how to, contact, to connect the pins of these two interface, of these two development board to uh, start uh, the uh, serial enhanced coexistence interface. And then this is very nice because these are wires and you can plug uh, oscilloscope to wires. You can uh, plug uh, um, logic analyzer and then you can start uh, really understanding what these two development board are exchanging. And this is what uh, uh, it looks like. So here you see we have the signal of uh, uh, the direction from the Bluetooth into the Wi-Fi in blue. And this is instead in the opposite direction, what the Wi-Fi is telling to the Bluetooth through the serial enhanced coexistence interface. Now, um, you see that the Bluetooth uh, is uh, continuously telling the Wi-Fi something. Because by the way, the Bluetooth, uh, the highest throughput you can get is approximately two megabit per second. And we monitor that when streaming music over Bluetooth headset, the Bluetooth keeps exchanging uh, signals over the sexy interface to the Wi-Fi at almost the same throughput. So basically we have the Bluetooth chipset that is streaming over the air music over my head, headset. And at the same time, the Bluetooth has to continuously for each packet that it is transmitting, ask the Wi-Fi permission to transmit the packet. Okay, so we have the same throughput, two megabit to stream music and internally two megabit to talk to the Wi-Fi and tell the Wi-Fi, please, don't transmit anything because I'm streaming music over a headset. 
So here it is what happens instead uh, in the Wi-Fi chipset. The Wi-Fi in this case was uh, uh, actually not connected to any network. It was uh, uh, simply scanning uh, availability of uh, neighboring networks. And in fact, we can see that uh, in the range of almost four seconds, only a few times the Wi-Fi was telling the Bluetooth, hey, look, no, wait, wait, don't stream music for a while because I need to, to scan for Wi-Fi access. Then, uh, okay, this was a, a zoom into this uh, uh, upper uh, diagram. And instead, this is what happens when we have a user that is typing over a keyboard that is connected through Bluetooth uh, to the development board. We can clearly see the typical uh, key presses. So here, uh, from the Wi-Fi, by the using this serial enhanced coexistent interface, the Bluetooth is basically telling the Wi-Fi chipset that the user is uh, uh, typing something on a keyboard. So if we have remote access to the Wi-Fi, then we can monitor what the Bluetooth chipset is doing. Okay, then uh, this is what happens on these uh, two wire interface, this serial enhanced coexistent interface. And now we are interested in understanding what we can do by reconfiguring this interface uh, to discover what are the damages, what are the vulnerabilities that we can uh, mount uh, against a, a chipset that uh, we are controlling. So uh, we are now trying to see how to reconfigure the sexy interface and what we can achieve. Um, then, first of all, Giska, as I told you, the, my colleague uh, in Germany, she has uh, a lot of experience with Bluetooth and she already discovered that it was possible to inject uh, uh, code into the Bluetooth chipset. So by writing a specific uh, patch, uh, she was able to uh, write uh, to specific uh, address uh, of this Bluetooth chipset. And she discovered that by writing random content, uh, we are still in the phase of random writing uh, without knowing what we are doing. So these are just uh, uh, attempt. By writing at this address, which by the way, in the uh, Cypress development kit uh, is reported as GCI, general uh, coexistence interface chip control. So she was able to crash the Wi-Fi. So she was able to observe a voltage drop with the logic analyzer. And interestingly, after the crash of uh, the Wi-Fi chipset, it was also possible to lead to a kernel panic on, on specific devices. So at least on MacBook, uh, 2016 uh, MacBook laptop, uh, it was possible to have a complete kernel crash. So here you can see on the left, uh, there is uh, the injection of the Bluetooth uh, code. And on the right, uh, there was uh, the Wi-Fi first stopping working. Now this is in loop. And afterwards, you see the MacBook completely crash and starts again. So um, first of all, you write, Wi-Fi crashes, and after a little bit, uh, the kernel understands the Wi-Fi was crashed and it was in a set, it was unrecoverable. And then um, in this case, it was Catalina Mac OS was decided to restart from scratch. So this is a, a short table containing all the devices that were vulnerable to this sort of, uh, of, of hack. You, you penetrate into the Bluetooth from the remote execution, from the outside, from the from the air, and then you inject uh, this uh, random uh, string into the GCI interface. And uh, according to this table, you see that for different devices, you have different effects. So in some cases, it's just a, a Wi-Fi that disconnects from the network it was connected. But in other cases, there were real kernel panic of the entire device that was then rebooting. In other case, uh, it was not possible to restart the Wi-Fi interface. So you have your, your smartphone. You don't understand what's going on. And uh, you see that uh, Wi-Fi does not work. So you reboot your Wi-Fi. But then after a while, the attacker that is uh, close to you is uh, injecting again this uh, remote code into the Bluetooth. And again, the Bluetooth is crashing the Wi-Fi. And then you have to restart the, the smartphone again and again. And you cannot realize what's going on because the host do not, does not realize that there is this sort of attack. So let's start now very, very quickly to understand uh, how the Wi-Fi uh, 
chipset uh, works so that uh, I can explain how we uh, modified the behavior of the serial enhanced coexist interface to understand how this interface uh, works and uh, how it is possible to exploit it for um, escalating from Bluetooth into Wi-Fi or the other way around. So um, as I told you, um, I have quite a good experience with this chipset. Uh, it's ages now that I'm working uh, mainly for, uh, for discovering uh, how to modify Wi-Fi and doing experiments to understand if I ever invented a more, um, a a <laughs> something interesting for performances uh, that was uh, better than the standard distributed coordination function for the Wi-Fi. And so, uh, well, um, it is my hobby and my job at the same time. So during the years of these uh, chips at, uh, starting from uh, 2003, was almost uh, the same. Uh, Broadcom added many and many features uh, because originally in 2003, we had uh, 11G devices, a maximum uh, 54 megabit per second. But the same architecture is still used today for state of the art 11AX chips that, uh, that are achieving uh, more than five gigabit per second. So the main uh, chipset uh, is this D11 uh, microcontroller that is uh, uh, running a very small software, uh, no more than 64 kilobytes, that is used for uh, um, accessing, for deciding uh, how to access the channel, when to transmit packets, for understanding that some frames are received from the AR. Okay, so there is this D11 CPU that was never documented, but after years, uh, we, and we know this uh, microcontroller very cool. So uh, thanks to some tools that we are developed uh, in the past, it is possible to disassemble this uh, small software to modify, reassemble, and uh, then um, upload to the chips. Because as I told you at the very beginning, uh, there are no signature on the, on the firmware. So it is possible to modify them. So this D11 core, it's a microcontroller that is uh, executing uh, software, uh, this small software at very high speed, uh, almost uh, 250 megahertz. And it is directly interfaced with uh, the transmission and the receiving engine. It's very nice because uh, you can uh, um, analyze frame that you are receiving from the air the moment that they are being received. So for instance, you can analyze a frame the moment it is received and uh, decide to stop this frame or to do whatever you want to not pass to the main host. So there is a lot of flexibility in the number of things you can do if you are, know how to modify the software of this small microcontroller. Interestingly, this microcontroller has this uh, serial enhanced coexistence interface directly integrated into it. So by modifying the software of this microcontroller, it is possible to modify the behavior of the serial analysis to access this interface. So uh, we uh, studied uh, this uh, small piece of software and we discovered that by the way, 12% of uh, this uh, small software in the case of this development board by Cypress was completely devoted to the so I really announced coexistence interface. So um, almost uh, one tenth of the code was there just to arbitrate uh, the channel access of the Wi-Fi with the Bluetooth. So this means that uh, arbitration for accessing the channel is a very difficult activity because 10% of the code is devoted to it. So by, by changing uh, how this uh, interface is uh, controlled by, the U by this D11 microcontroller, we can immediately understand that uh, what can happen uh, can be can lead to very to, to disaster. No? Well, then uh, let's first uh, have a look to this grant reject scheme that is integrated into this serial enhanced coexistence interface. So here it is uh, the diagram of uh, what happens uh, when we are streaming music to a headset uh, connected to Bluetooth. You see that uh, the Bluetooth uh, uh, side is uh, communicating continuously through this uh, sexy interface to the Wi-Fi because it's continuously sending frames into the air that are addressed to the headset for streaming audio. Then 
the Wi-Fi, the majority of the time in this case, uh, has to stay silent because otherwise it would uh, collide with uh, the music that uh, instead you are streaming to your headset. So um, you see here, we modify the Wi-Fi, the, the, the software of the microcontroller so that it was possible from the external to uh, inject a Wi-Fi frame so that the microcontroller when receiving this command over the air, simply was breaking the sexy interface by putting the Bluetooth chipset on hold. That means the Bluetooth is asking the Wi-Fi, can I transmit? No, the Wi-Fi always answers, no, you cannot. And in fact, when the Wi-Fi chipset is receiving, thanks to our modification to the software of the microcontroller, it is receiving this command over the air, that means, uh, stop uh, the Bluetooth, the Bluetooth actually stops. And in fact, uh, uh, the headset uh, that we were wearing simply was not transmitting music anymore. Then uh, we also implemented uh, the opposite command. So it was possible to restart the streaming over the Bluetooth by injecting another command over Wi-Fi. Of course, here, this was just an example. We modified directly the code of the Wi-Fi by uploading a modified code, but this also demonstrates the powerful of uh, this approach. So the Wi-Fi has the ability to completely kill the activity of the Bluetooth, okay? Then about uh, uh, this side channel uh, so that the Wi-Fi can study key presses. So I told you at the beginning, it was possible. In fact, you see that for each key press, a user is uh, typing on a, a Bluetooth connected keyboard, the Wi-Fi observes uh, the key press on uh, this serial enhanced coexistence interface. So here we were typing uh, quite uh, quickly. And in fact, in the Wi-Fi, we were able to observe key presses uh, with uh, the same um, pacing of uh, the uh, user that was typing over a keyboard. And we know that in these cases, there are uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, cryptanalysts, people that can tell you if I can observe timing between key presses, then I can also guess what the user is typing on the keyboard, especially maybe understanding a password. So it was possible, we demonstrated that it was possible if we had access to the Wi-Fi because we already um, exploit the Wi-Fi to understand the event of the Bluetooth chips. Okay, this is just by studying this uh, serial enhanced coexistence interface. And now let's switch to the RAM sharing that in principle would allow um, much uh, worse attack because uh, one thing, as I said, is a serial interface. Another thing is when you can observe the RAM of a chipset, the Wi-Fi, from another chipset that is the Bluetooth. So first of all, RAM sharing. So RAM sharing, we started uh, um, guessing that there was this feature, let's call it feature, because in this uh, data sheet uh, from the uh, chipset embedded in the Google Nexus 5, it was clearly mentioned. There is a RAM sharing interface between the two chipsets. Okay, can we exploit this? Uh, can we uh, then uh, uh, study from the Bluetooth the RAM of uh, the uh, Wi-Fi? Uh, it seems possible according to the data sheet, but here we have a problem. And the problem is that uh, if we go back to the slide of uh, the uh, two development board that we were using for understanding the sexy interface. So this is a serial enhanced coexistence interface. These are totally completely separate devices. So they are just connected using a serial interface so there is no mean, no way that they are sharing the RAM because there is no actual bus for sharing the RAM. So for uh, understanding how RAM sharing was working, uh, we had to uh, go and uh, study a lot of uh, firmware until when we discovered that Apple forgot to completely remove the symbols of the driver in the 2016 model. And this driver was mentioning in the Bluetooth software, this WLAN buff 
something. So this driver was not correctly stripped uh, of the symbols that were there for debugging purposes. Sometimes it happens. And we then discovered the address in the side of the Bluetooth chipset where these WLAN buff objects were located. So basically uh, by exploiting this uh, almost leak by Apple, we were able to understand that the Bluetooth can read information from the Wi-Fi RAM starting from this uh, uh, position, from this offset into the Bluetooth memory. So it's directly mapped the uh, Wi-Fi memory in the Bluetooth memory at this address. So we started writing uh, arbitrary things into the Wi-Fi memory until when we found a match between what we were reading from the Bluetooth and what we, we had written from the Wi-Fi before. And then we, we, we said, okay, but then what happens if we write into this memory? Random, random writing. And here it comes something very interesting because uh, um, by writing at this uh, uh, offset, uh, it was uh, uh, almost always crashing uh, the um, Wi-Fi uh, chipset of uh, Samsung Galaxy S10. Then, interestingly, it was possible from the main host to see the kernel dump of this Wi-Fi chipset. And there, we noticed that uh, in this kernel dump, it was reporting uh, the um, program counter that we tried to inject from the Bluetooth uh, chipset. So this meant that uh, finally we found how to force the Wi-Fi chipset into executing code that we were injecting from the Bluetooth chipset. So here there is another small movie that is demonstrated that by writing into the memory of the uh, Bluetooth chipset, immediately there was a, a watchdog function uh, that was uh, triggered in the WLAN that was almost uh, stopping working. This is what happens in, 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 in a MacBook. Uh, as soon as you write, almost immediately you see that the Wi-Fi first uh, lose connectivity with the network it was connected. And there is a, a, in the kernel of the main host, a watchdog function that immediately triggers. Okay, so it was possible to crash the Wi-Fi. Okay, nice, nice achievement. Then uh, here a quick table to report that there are a lot of devices that are exposed to this vulnerability. The addresses are the same. So uh, we discovered this address by studying this uh, driver in this uh, old MacBook, but it turned out that the same address was also uses, used in uh, recent devices, including this iPhone 11 with the very recent uh, version of iOS. So um, then this is uh, uh, what happened in 2018. Then we, we of course, uh, there were improvements that uh, we will publish this year after after a lot of, a few years, that we are publishing this year at Security and Privacy 2022. So for those that are interested, you will see the follow-up to this work in uh, Security and Privacy that is occurring uh, in the next month. Then, okay, uh, what about uh, PCI Express? Because if you think about uh, the Wi-Fi chips that this is connected, to the main host, that means the CPU that is running either Android or Linux or, or uh, Mac OS using PCI Express. So uh, it was interesting because we can, from the Bluetooth, uh, exploit the Wi-Fi by forcing a code execution into the Wi-Fi from the Bluetooth. And then once we are in the Wi-Fi, we can write specific code that can exploit the PCI Express bus to the main host for injecting code into the main host. Okay, this is a, a demonstration that it is possible because here in this movie, you see that what happens, we are sending using a over the air remote code execution something to Bluetooth that uh, is then sending something to the Wi Fi and then thanks to the connection that is a PCI Express bus, the Wi-Fi is finally crashing, completely crashing the, uh, this uh, old iPhone, okay. 
So then, uh, countermeasure. Of course, uh, it's not up uh, to us in developing countermeasure, but uh, as soon as we discover this vulnerability, we immediately reported the vulnerability to manufacturer. So Broadcom was very was very nice with us. So they considered, okay, so we have this new CD. Thanks, guys. And then we need to develop patches, okay? So what is a patch in this case? Because uh, so uh, there is a connection through the PCI Express. You cannot patch the physical bus between the Wi-Fi and the main host because this is circuit. So the patch that they developed was uh, quite naive. Basically, they forbid the possibility to uh, do memory writing from the uh, driver in the main host to the Bluetooth. But this is not actually a patch because I can still exploit the over the air remote execution vulnerability, which unfortunately cannot be prevented by this patch. So unfortunately, it seems that uh, it is not possible to prevent this behavior unless uh, you are so um, good that you can prevent uh, the remote code execution in, uh, in the Bluetooth, which actually, Broadcom was so good in preventing, but only for modern devices. For all devices, uh, including uh, iPhone 6, 6E and 7, this was not possible because uh, unfortunately the patch RAM for uh, uh, creating and adding patches to the Bluetooth code is uh, no more free because uh, it's full of other patches. So they cannot patch these chips at uh, farther. So they cannot prevent anybody in running a remote code execution over the air into your iPhone 6 or 7. Okay, then uh, we are close to the end of this talk. Uh, what about other chips? Because uh, we, in this uh, uh, entire presentation, I was talking only about, about uh, Broadcom. So are there other chips that are exposed to this? Well, uh, of course, yes because uh, the serial enhanced access interface was something proprietary developed by Broadcom, then acquired by Cypress and also by Infineon that also acquired Cypress. But then what about the other chipset? Well, there are other interfaces like uh, this uh, mobile wire standard MWS that was specifically designed by the Bluetooth SIG to um, arbitrary transmission with the LTE. And in fact, there are other manufacturers that are um, using this interface for uh, arbitrary transmission between LTE and, and Bluetooth. You can see uh, um, the development of this uh, into security and privacy. So if you are interested in understanding how we hack at this MLWS interface for the other manufacturer, please connect and attend the, the security and privacy. I can here briefly mention that we found a very similar vulnerability in almost all chipset, including Intel, MediaTek, Qualcomm, Texas, Instruments, Marvel, and XP. So they have all, they are all using this type of interface for uh, arbitrating channel access between different chipset, which means in principle, it is possible to escalate from one chipset to the other without the main host to even understand what's going on. Interestingly, when we reported uh, this to Qualcomm, their, their answer was uh, the, 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 the best because they told us, no, guys, you are wrong. We are not vulnerable to this vulnerability because uh, we don't have separate chipset for Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, but we control everything into the same chipset, which is even better for attacker because you have uh, two ways for entering one chipset. And once you are there, you are there. So you don't need to run this uh, very complex uh, uh, escalation that I described in the spectra, uh, in, the, in this spectra presentation. Okay, so now let's see, let's uh, recap a uh, quick summary. Uh, we have a Bluetooth remote code uh, execution that was originally found by Jiska. It was then possible, uh, thanks to our joint work, to escalate from the Bluetooth into the Wi-Fi. 
And then uh, in principle, uh, we demonstrate that uh, it is possible to lead to kernel panic, to uh, uh, escalate into the main host by using exploit in PCI Express that is connecting the Wi-Fi. And then, uh, well, uh, we also demonstrated that it is in principle possible to have the same kind of vulnerability for LD. Now, uh, this is it. I have uh, yeah, my last slide. Uh, where I ask if there are any questions and uh, I, I, this concludes my presentation. I hope somebody, okay, okay. <laughs> I don't know if, if there are some question or not. Uh, I don't know. So, yeah, Francesco, thank you again, once again for your time. As usual, your clarity was really, really, really super. Yeah, I found what you have exposed in this seminar is really interesting. As you know, we are, uh, our focus on my department is interested in this kind of vulnerabilities. Uh, if possible, send us the, the slides of this seminar. It was very, sure. very good. Yes, yeah. yes, so, yes. And uh, of course, we will certainly continue in the coming months, also with the Professor Bianchi, and right yes, now, yes. of course, com com compatible with your commitment with, with the exam and so on. Uh, I don't know if there are some question. Maybe I take a look in the chat. No, okay, no. It was very very clear. Okay, Prof. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks Thank you. Coming. Okay, so uh, speak soon. Maybe maybe now the, the situation in the UEA is coming well better, going better. Maybe it is possible to to we see here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see. Yes, could be nice. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank Have you. Nice Thank you. So, Goodbye. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Tell me. Okay, Alex. Alexey Kuzmenko is my my colleague. Yes. The question is, yes, could we emulate all the steps to find similar vulnerabilities and speed up the process of exposing such problems during the development? Yeah. Well, uh, you I mean if uh, development, uh, what is the meaning of development? Because if you are the manufacturer, uh, you well, uh, yeah, you already know that there are these vulnerability. Otherwise, um, yeah, it is possible to emulate this behavior and uh, of course, uh, uh, for uh, our uh, work, uh, we were using QEMU for because it was uh, much faster into understanding uh, how to uh, uh, the, the, the chips that were communicating uh, the state machines. So, if you are thinking about emulation of the firmware, yes, sure, we are uh, constantly emulating firmware for speeding up uh, research of this type of vulnerability. But um, maybe I did not understand correctly the question. So. Um, let me know. Please tell me if uh, if I answered or not. Yes, Ale, uh, uh, Alexei asked regarding is it could we emulate all the steps to find this kind of vulnerabilities, of course, and also to speed up the process for exposing such such problem like this uh, during the the development of the of the hardware of the microcode of the kernel, yeah. Um, well, uh, yes, of course, if you are a developer, uh, uh, it means that, uh, sure, you can uh, try to understand what's going on because uh, you can put also uh, counters in your uh, U-code, uh, counters in your uh, ARM uh, uh, firmware so that you can clearly see if there are anomalies like uh, somebody trying to exploit this vulnerability, for sure, yes. But you don't need to actually emulate, but you need to just add a modified uh, firmware so that you can uh, put uh, specific counters here and there to understand uh, if uh, everything is going uh, as expected or not. So this is typically done. Yeah, okay. There is another, another question regarding the, the hardware. Is coming from Zine, is a, another colleagues. Is how is possible to write to a specific register address on the Wi Fi through the shared RAM with the Bluetooth? And this is exactly the vulnerabilities, yeah. Yes, uh, well, uh, it was not possible to write at a very specific address. Uh, so basically, one region in the Bluetooth chipset was mapped one to one to another region in the Wi Fi. And it was just by chance 
that there, there was a function table for the Wi-Fi. So by modifying this uh, function table after having written a specific code in another part of this shared RAM, it was possible uh, by chance, but we were lucky. In this case, uh, the manufacturer was unlucky. It was possible to force the Wi-Fi into jumping at some point directly into the code that we injected because we modified the function table. So that was uh, uh, jumping no more to the original address, but uh, to the code that uh, we put exactly in that region of shared RAM.